Hi everyone, you're back with The Lone Wolf again. In this video, I'm going to talk about something a little bit different. It's going to be about the life and times of F. Scott Fitzgerald, one of the greatest American writers of all time. A wise man learns from the mistakes of others. An average man learns from his own mistakes. And a fool never learns. By learning from others, we can forge our own path through life and avoid making the same mistakes as these key figures. So let's begin. The story of F. Scott Fitzgerald is a tragic and depressing one, given his talent, skill and literary proficiency. A writer of great promise, he became synonymous with the glitz, glamour and decadence of the jazz age and roaring twenties. Sadly, it could be said that he never realised his true potential, and his life was cut tragically short through a combination of ill health and alcoholism. Posthumously, he is remembered as one of the greatest American writers of the 20th century. Here, I'm going to take a retrospective look at his life and times to illustrate what we can all learn from the man and hopefully enhance our own lives. Francis Scott Key Fitzgerald, often known as Scott, was born on the 24th of September 1896 in St. Paul, Minnesota, to Edward Fitzgerald, a wicker furniture manufacturer of English and Irish ancestry, and Molly Fitzgerald, Nee McQuillan, his mother of Irish heritage. Scott was named after his second cousin three times removed, Francis Scott Key, who wrote the lyrics to the American national anthem, The Star Spangled Banner, and also after Louise Scott, one of two sisters who died not long before he was born. When Scott was two years old, his father's business collapsed, leading to him becoming a wholesale grocery salesman for Procter & Gamble. The family were forced to change location several times by way of Syracuse and Buffalo, New York, between 1898 and 1908. During his formative years, he was described as intelligent with drive and a keen early interest in literature. His caring mother ensured that he benefited fully from an affluent upbringing. However, the frequent change of location during his early childhood years would have no doubt isolated him and made it difficult to make friends at school and elsewhere. In 1908, he settled at St. Paul Academy after his father was fired from his job at Procter & Gamble, thus forcing a move back to Minnesota. At the age of 13, Scott had developed a real passion for literature and was immersed in the work of Jane Porter, Walter Scott and G. A. Henty. He also achieved his first piece of writing to appear in print, a detective story called The Mystery of the Raymond Mortgage, published in the school newspaper. He also began to explore literary themes, including the social difficulties of the outsider, no doubt influenced by his early years. In 1911, at the age of 15, Scott was again uprooted due to poor academic achievement and sent to Newman School, a prestigious Catholic prep school in Hackensack, New Jersey. Given the proximity of Newman to New York City, Scott was allowed to explore Manhattan and go to see shows in the city. At school he was unpopular with the other boys and considered to be aloof and overbearing. This is understandable given that by now he had no doubt grown accustomed to not settling in, and this would have further compounded his status as a social outcast. At Newman, Scott participated in the school football team. Indeed, many of us can assert the benefits of team sports for social cohesion and bonding, but this led to further exclusion and isolation after he wrote a poem for the school magazine, The Newman News. It was entitled Football and was inspired by a traumatic incident on the field of play. He was accused of cowardice and this further contributed to his isolation. So on the one hand, he was trying to cement himself within the social environment at school through sport, whilst pursuing his passion for writing, but unfortunately, one of his pursuits was going to have to suffer. In his last year at Newman, Scott would continue to publish short stories in the Newman News. He would also meet the prominent Catholic priest, Father Cyril Sigourney Webster Fay, a key figure in his early life that would inform much of his aesthetic and moral compass throughout his career. Father Fay noticed Scott's talent for the written word and encouraged it, stressing that he should pursue his literary ambitions. Such support from an adult at that time would no doubt have been invaluable and would have boosted his confidence immensely, especially given his difficult childhood at that point. There is something to be said for boosting a child's confidence, especially a boy's, as they often need reinforcement and direction, particularly during the teenage years when they're finding their feet in life and can easily go off the rails. We can all learn a lesson or two from this phase of Scott's life, and that is to follow your goals and passions relentlessly, ignore the naysayers, Go your own way and seek out a positive male role model. 
After graduating from Newman, despite low academic performance, Scott decided to stay in New Jersey to continue his development and pursue his craft at the prestigious Princeton University. He took the entrance exams and his fees were paid for with a legacy left by his late grandmother, who died a month before he commenced his studies in September 1913. It is clear at this time that Scott was putting tremendous effort and time into his writing at the expense of his academic work. Now this is a topic for another time, but school is often a poor barometer for success and does not truly measure academic prowess or accomplishment. At Princeton, Fitzgerald fervently pursued his writing at the expense of his coursework, a recurring theme. He did try out for a, the college football team, but was cut on the first day of practice, and this was perhaps a blessing in disguise. Instead, he forged positive relationships with other writers at the college, such as John Peel Bishop and Edmund Wilson, and wrote articles for a number of university publications. He had also progressed considerably from a social perspective, given his inclusion in the Cottage Club, which was a prominent exclusive eating club, and the Triangle Club, which was a theatre troupe. His goals of social dominance on campus were dashed, though, as a side effect of his poor academic performance. We can see that at this time, Scott was indeed focused on attaining some degree of social proficiency and belonging, no doubt a result of the deep-rooted effects of his childhood. From an external standpoint, we can understand that belonging is fantastic if the people you are with help you grow. In this instance, Scott should have continued focusing on his writing and academic pursuits instead of trying to attain some sort of social renown on campus. I do believe that this was the result of years of isolation during his childhood, and there was something to be said for limiting relocation, especially during a child's developmental years. Due to his poor academic performance, he was placed on probation in 1917 and quit to join the US Army. Fearing his death in World War I with his dreams unfulfilled, he hastily wrote a novel called The Romantic Egotist. Although it was rejected by Scribner's and the second of his efforts to be so, the editor praised Scott's originality in writing, encouraging him to submit more work in the future. It is rare for anyone to succeed at the first attempt, or even many attempts, of asking, but the lesson here is to continually pursue what you want, especially given the things Fitzgerald achieved. Fitzgerald was eventually commissioned as a second lieutenant in the army and stationed at Camp Sheridan near Montgomery, Alabama. While at a country club, he met and became infatuated with Zelda Sert, the 18-year-old socialite daughter of an Alabama Supreme Court justice and the golden girl of Montgomery Youth Society. They began courting and Fitzgerald proposed marriage, but Zelda was reluctant to marry a man with so few prospects and inability to provide for a family. Now this is where it all starts to go wrong for him, in my opinion. Up to this point, he had been focused solely on his craft, on his work in writing, improving his skills and dedicating all his time to this, and starting to have early success. The moment that he met Zelda, things started to fall apart. Now this is not Zelda's fault, because some blame must no doubt lie with an all-boy schooling during his early years of life, his social isolation and other issues. I'm not from that time, so I can't speculate on the mindset or cultural aspects that were prevalent then. But why did he have to put Zelda on a pedestal, purely based on her looks, not character? Looks that she gained purely by genetics and not through any degree of hard work. Busting his ass, hastily writing a novel prior to going to the Western Front, wondering if his life will be meaningless, should he get shot or blown up, with dreams unfulfilled. And this prima donna socialite simply has to choose the best suitor, based purely upon material concerns, not personality, or even looks for that matter. Nevertheless, Scott and Zelda began an intense courtship, exchanging letters on a weekly basis, yet Fitzgerald was aware of Zelda's uncommitted dating of other men. The war ended in 1918, before Scott was deployed, and the proximity to him actually being deployed affected him. This is evident in a number of characters, including that of Jay Gatsby. Subsequently, Scott returned to New York to pursue an advertising career lucrative enough to convince Zelda to marry him. Put another way, he needed a job that paid enough so he could afford her. Money in exchange for marriage, intimacy and the whole nine yards. In fact, he would probably have been better off getting a professional, but that's beside the point. It is cringeworthy when you think about it. She doesn't want you as a person, Mr Fitzgerald. She wants resources. I hate to say it, but Fitzgerald at this time evokes all the qualities of a simp, thirsty, needy, 
beta male. He should have said, you know what, I'm going to go off and make it big and become a hugely successful writer. You can either join me or not. I don't really care if I marry you or not. Find another suitor. I don't need you and I don't need any validation from you. I'm not playing the game. Fitzgerald produced copy for trolley car advertisements at Baron Collier by day, whilst at night he worked hard on his fiction, collecting 112 rejection slips during this period. The passion and graft he was putting in is evident to me, at least, and we can all learn from his relentless pursuit of success. Buoyed by some early success in the smart set, which was a literary magazine, Fitzgerald opted to leave his job in New York to finish his novel This Side of Paradise at his parents' home in St. Paul. This new draft was more attractive to Scribner than previous efforts, and Maxwell Perkins wrote Fitzgerald on the 16th of September 1919 to say that the novel had been accepted. Harold Ober was subsequently hired to act as his agent, a highly beneficial partnership during Fitzgerald's most prolific years that would also cause Ober some problems from time to time. Contrary to what one might think, the bulk of Fitzgerald's income would be provided by short stories written in between his novels. Upon acceptance of this side of paradise, Fitzgerald cabled Zelda immediately, and she then came to New York to marry and live with him. They married on April the 3rd, 1920, Zelda's fears about her suitor's solvency seemingly assuaged. Unbelievable, right? In fact, Fitzgerald had written to publisher Maxwell Perkins asking for an accelerated release, saying, I have so many things dependent on its success, including, of course, a girl. This is one of the worst cases of one itis I've ever heard of, to be honest, only bested by Fitzgerald's own creation, Jay Gatsby. This period coincided with great success for Fitzgerald, and he had moved into an apartment on New York's West 59th Street. He was also working prodigiously on his second novel. Zelda discovered she was pregnant in February 1921, and the couple toured Europe taking in many sights and attractions. Their only child, Francis Scott, Scotty Fitzgerald, was born in St. Paul on the 26th of October. Fitzgerald was in his element, producing a large amount of high-quality work in prolific order. The 1920s were a crucial period in Fitzgerald's development, and he formed close links with the expatriate community in Paris and the French Riviera, particularly with Ernest Hemingway. Indeed, he made several trips to Europe during this time. Hemingway disliked Zelda, describing her as insane and encouraging Scott to drink so as to distract him from his work on his next novel. Moreover, Zelda had said that their bedroom life was declining due to Scott having an affair with Hemingway, leading to Scott deciding to bed a professional to prove how straight he was to his wife. Like, how can his wife be so jealous of a dude and his friendship with a, fe a fellow colleague, a fellow writer, that he's driven to those lengths. I'm sure in the modern era, we've all heard of guys who have to, like wives that can be so jealous of a dude who's just happy with a television, a couple of his friends come round, a bag of chips and a beer, and that it, they can just be happy. And I'm sure if you've seen the Bill Burr stand-up, you'll be able to relate to that. You think about how easy it is for a guy to be entertained. It's sad that Fitzgerald's passion for writing novels was not rewarded with the income that it deserved, and at any rate, the grandiose lifestyle he and his wife adopted meant that Scott was of often in financial turmoil and required loans from his agent and editor. Only his first novel sold enough to accommodate this lifestyle. The Great Gatsby sadly did not become successful until after his death. When Ober decided against advancing him any more money, Scott severed ties with his longtime friend and agent. So rather than looking at himself, and particularly his wife's decadent lifestyle, he takes it out on his agent that has already advanced him money and was a key contributor in his success. It is very sad that Scott was blind to this at the time, and this is the goal of the video here, to provide a document of just what can happen to a man given a disastrous environment. Although the French Riviera provided Scott with the time and space optimal for writing The Great Gatsby, further stress was placed on his marriage when Zelda met French pilot Edouard Jozan, beginning a romantic entanglement. We've heard that word before, haven't we? Jada Pinkett Smith. By 1924, their relations became difficult, and Scott's drinking had morphed into genuine alcoholism. 
and he gained a reputation as one of the prominent drunks of American literature at the time. He became notorious for his heavy drinking during the Roaring Twenties, and by the 1930s it badly affected his health. Everything in moderation, nothing to excess, is a key mantra. In 1927, Fitzgerald moved to Hollywood to write a comedy that was never produced, but he began a dalliance with Lois Moran, a 17-year-old aspiring actress. Now if you take age out of the equation, disregard the age for a moment. Is it not an eye for an eye, given what Zelda is up to at this time? After the couple moved back east to Delaware, Zelda expressed a desire to carve out a niche and forge her own identity, as opposed to that of wife of a famous writer, I would suspect. She attempted to become a writer herself, and at the age of 27, a ballerina as well, practicing exhaustively. It is interesting to note that were it not for the efforts of Scott, she would have been unable to invest this time and energy in such pursuits. Be that as it may, she completed a novel called Save Me the Waltz, shortly after she was admitted to the Phipps Psychiatric Clinic at Johns Hopkins University for Schizophrenia, although it was thought to actually be bipolar disorder, brought on by growing instability, Scott's alcoholism and their turbulent marriage. Scott was furious that she had used material from their marriage to inform the book, and he managed to edit some of this out prior to publication. The book did not sell very well, and Scott's own semi-autobiographical account of their marriage, Tender as the Night, provides a counterpoint to Zelda's version. Zelda's remaining years were dominated by a mental illness, and she required expensive medical care on Fitzgerald's behalf. Scott's decline was rapid, and on his 40th birthday, an article was published highlighting this fall in the New York Post. He battled influenza, alcoholism, tuberculosis, and attempted self-termination with a morphine overdose. He was no longer able to depend on his literary abilities, and thus his income dropped significantly. He owed money to his agent and editor while also paying Zelda's medical bills and supporting both himself and his daughter. Some brief work as a screenwriter in Hollywood helped him for a while, but his drinking put pay to that. He also sparked up a relationship with an English gossip columnist called Sheila Graham, probably due to a physical similarity to his wife, and at any rate Zelda would not have known about it given her condition. Although by this time Ober had pulled the plug on any more money for Scott, he continued to support their daughter Scotty as the Obers had been surrogate parents to her at any rate. Fitzgerald declined rapidly in health and died suddenly of a heart attack in 1940 at the age of 44, believing himself to be a failure. The remaining years of their marriage were estranged and full of resentment. Scott maliciously resented Zelda by this stage, blaming her for ruining him, exhausting his talents and cheating him of his dreams. He was bitter at his failures and the continued success of Hemingway. Zelda herself died in 1948, aged 47, when her hospital caught fire. It seems that Zelda Fitzgerald, in recent years, has become an effinist icon. She's been reclaimed, a victim of an overbearing husband whose talents were belittled and suppressed by the patriarchy. That's not up for debate in this video. What this video addresses is the tragedy that Fitzgerald died in 1940 considering himself a failure, his work forgotten, yet posthumously The Great Gatsby is recognized as one of the greatest works in all of literature and certainly one of the greatest American novels, one of the best selling. The major lessons we can draw from his life, in summary, are to avoid one-itis, develop your passions and career with yourself as the main driving force. Recognize that your legacy is very important, be that your body of work, your children if you choose to have them, you don't want to leave their care to others, and you certainly don't want to depend on loans from friends and business associates. You need mastery over the personal and professional domains of your life. I hope you enjoyed my analysis. As always, thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe on your way out, and I'll see you in the next video.